Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi sitting in Italy and today we want to do a special edition uh, seeing the present crisis in the world by the coronavirus. And we want to talk about who we are in this moment, in the current context and what can Ubuntu and Integral do and help to overcome this crisis and maybe even create a better world afterwards. So I invited uh, Dr. Dumi Magatlela and Paddy Pampalis from South Africa and we want to explore these things. And before we do that, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Dumi? Okay. Uh, my name is Dumi Sani Magatlela. I'm a a coach based in South Af in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I work with the the coaching center and Integral Africa Institute. We, we we develop coaches, we train coaches, and I work around the continent and around the world. And part of my work, I'm a, as as faculty of the the coaching center, we we bring in Ubuntu into that, and which is a a global uh, phenomenon, a way of being that looks at the fact that we are, I am because we are, that's Ubuntu. And we bring in Gestalt into that, bring in other lenses, other ways of looking at who we are and how we are. And I've been with the coaching center now for for many years, over 10 years. And my colleague on this, on this uh, conversation, a good old friend, Dr. Paddy Pambalis will introduce herself and she's the, the founder of the school. And part of my work also, I'm on the, uh, I serve as a trustee on the, on the board of the International Coach Federation Foundation. It's a global part looking at, uh, looking at what coaching can really do to, to contribute towards becoming more humane around the world. What, what is coaching's greatest contribution to humanity and the planet? So that's part of my work and briefly that's part of what who I am and what I, I work, what I do, but more of who I am in this context. And I'm very fascinated by what we can, what this is offering us as coaches, at least in this, in this part of the world, to impact our ways of being globally in this, in the context of this crisis. So yeah, Paddy. Thank you, oh, you Jimmy. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I have been in education. So my path through through life has been from education into psychology and psychotherapy and setting up um, integrative ways of looking at the world into coaching, into running the own, my own business. And we've been for nearly 20 years, we've been running a school of integral coaching. Um, and developed the integral coaching into integral Africa um, and bringing our own African philosophy. And I, I, I put our own in inverted commas, the, integral, the Ubuntu philosophy, which is of humanist a, a philosophy of humanity. Um, integrating, I think one of the contributions that I've offered is how the the I and the we of the integral frame has been able to be um, balanced very beautifully and integrated with I am because we are um, <clears throat> through the African philosophy. Um, so yeah, this is a time, Heidi, as I think you said, that we people like us and many in the world who've been working with skills and cultivating our understanding of the complexity of the world um, are called, have been prepared somewhere for um, supporting a stage like this. And hopefully it will be a big shift in consciousness. We're um, very connected in the work that we do. So spanning our work in organizational levels spans with governments, spans with some of the largest and small NGOs, um, community work, we work in business, we work um, in higher education and obviously the health um, uh, domain as well. And, you know, post pro processing this myself, um, I am in self-isolation because I was in a, a very busy um, 
uh, airport a week ago with lots of people traveling from all over the world. And um, the slowing down and the, the way to consider other means of working in the world is what we, we've been teaching and hoping and grappling with. And now we are being called to go, how do we do this? What are those things that we can support others with? And not from a place of absolute knowing, but from a place of complete exploration and going into holding a very sacred and contained space, which enables people to think and manage this anxiety. So I'm fascinated by what it's going to bring up and hope we can contribute. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. And I want to say to the listeners, I have done interviews with both of you, with Dumi, about Ubuntu. So if you want to know a little bit better what Ubuntu is, look up the recording in the wisdomfactory.net uh, and you punch in Dumi uh, and he will come out. <laughs> and Paddy, in instead, we uh, have talked right after the conference, which was organized and had the title Doing Better Humans. And you were mainly co-creating co the conference, which was beautiful, by the way. And I think it's the beginning already, you know, of what is, has now come to a, to a moment where we need the information we had there, the practices we had there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, let's dive in into the, into the problem and the, there is a noise somewhere. I don't know if it's on your uh, side somewhere. I don't know. Maybe it's motorcycles still running around. Yeah. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> And what we also want to explore are the gifts, as you already have mentioned, that what we were saying, we, we can do life different in a different way. And now we are sort of forced to do that. And maybe that's not a bad idea. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because we, we talk a lot until we're actually forced to take action. Um, and this is a, you know, do, do we wake up? Do we grow up? Do we clean up to show up differently as, as Wilbur talks about? And there's also the other comp part of his, you know, as he spoke at the Integral African Conference um, by um, the internet, um, he spoke about the opening up. You know, how, how do we open up at this time rather than close up um, and contract? And of course, I think a lot of us um, you know, we'll be managing that in various forms across developmental levels of our own maturity in, in that that we um, will probably fall back into earlier spaces of fear and anxiety and our need for safety. So it is how do we open up? How do we kind of create this opening? And, and the, the very big paradox for us is that we've been asked to open up and isolate and that, that's a, pol you know, a polarity. It can be turned into a beautiful polarity wisdom moment of how do we hold these tensions between being in, in communication and being in relationship, shifting the way we do things, but also being in our own selves and meeting our own selves in ways that perhaps we have been able to delude ourselves from in so many ways and avoid and distract. Um, so the opportunity of going, who are you? Who are you really? And who are you together with others is a very important question now. And, and it, to add onto that, thank you, Paddy. Another question that comes to mind is, who am I becoming in this context? And when I look in the mirror, who do I see? And, and there's, a, there's a bigger picture of we we owe it to ourselves to hold lightly to our current frames of who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the, what, what, what Wilbur was talking about in the, in the conference, which I was, I was really honored to be part of, is that opening up, that part of, it's, it's not closing in, but opening up and noticing ourselves becoming that. What is that that we're becoming, we are becoming? And what do we need? to become in order for us, say, to fight collectively. This virus, for example, that does not choose geography, race, age, and that. It does not discriminate. It does not have the, 
the, the frames, the lenses, the, the limiting, and as Pedi, Pedi has always said in, in her teaching, the limiting and limited uh, narrative or paradigms of who we are, which, which constrict us and constrain us. This virus doesn't have those. It doesn't discriminate. It just infects every, everyone. So the point of it is then in that context for us to respond better and, and fight back and win this war or this, come out at the other end of this, renewed and new and dare I say better human beings, we need to loosen our grip on who we are now. And I love what the, the theme that Perry had for the conference that says, doing human better. We have to do human better after this. If we fail, I mean, this is an opportunity in this darkness for us to, to see the light that we are human and we are better than we have been before. Yeah. I would even go further. I would say uh, that this came about because we didn't do human better by ourselves. And so Mother Earth or whoever it is, I don't know, everybody believes in something else, has decided they need a kick, these people. And before, you know, when the Ebola was in Africa, it's so far away or other things. And now it's really everyone, even our German counselor, I, I heard today, she is in, um, in uh, quarantine now. So really everyone and even the super rich uh, will uh, be affected in some way. They might have more means than the poor ones to, to you know, get what they need. But still, it doesn't stop on any threshold. And this is the big, big chance in my idea that we can do human better because nobody can say, oh, that doesn't touch me, you know? Yeah. Jimmy, there are if, if I have a question for you, Pedi, on, on something that I know you, you're passionate about. When you talk about uh, what we need, to, how do we need to position ourselves? What is our stance in your view, Pedi, on uh, when change comes and some of us can freeze or something, what are your views around that on, on how we can best position ourselves to yeah. in, in this context of, of COVID-19? I, I, I'll answer, I'll respond to that. Um, and I want to hold two things that you said to me around um, maybe sharing with people who would listen to this, the um, linguistic base of the I am because we are in the in Guni languages around the prefix of the, the word holding the I and the becoming, the, the being and becoming so inherent in the actual linguistic structure of that. So if you could talk more to that just now, because there's something in that essence of our own linguistic structures on how we frame in this, what are we saying about it? How are we naming it? And um, the connection with ourselves as a whole being, um, the other thing I wanted to park just to, to look at the words we use in terms of war, are we at war with this? Or are we, is it, um, do we need to befriend it in, in a way of its learning and teaching and see it as a spark of wisdom that, um, you know, when we don't, work according to nature and, and um, humanity. If I'm talking about humanity, I'm including the earth. I'm including sentient beings in that. I, I know I have a language that prefers the word humanity, but I, I look at my dog, I look at the butterflies, I look at the leaves, I look at the trees, I look at the blue skies, um, the water, the, 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 the systems that we have in, in our um, environment at the moment and in our, our own context, how do we approach those? So one of the things we chatted about was um, Jimmy and I a little earlier on in the conversation was how people in managing change or managing this curve that we're having to face. I kind of gave the analogy when we see the tsunamis coming, I don't know, you know, all those pictures or videos that flooded the the, the net in terms of a volcano happening or a, um, a snow avalanche or um, the tsunamis. If you catch a photograph of people, people are mesmerized at the moment some of this change happens. They kind of caught in a, 
in a dreamlike state, in a trance, <clears throat> watching it, not being able to process it. The mind, the brain can't actually process the reality of it. And some will even, you know, stand there and take another photograph of it because it needs to be captured onto some media to share their experience, but they're not in the experience of it. They're actually looking at it through another lens, but not actually in the real reality of the experience of the tsunami coming. So this wave's coming towards you, and all of a sudden, you'll see people light up and start communicating with each other. And almost when it's on us only, do people start running or taking action. So there's something about pulling that, that um, lens, the kind of lens close up sooner. And I think that's part of our work. How do we bring the lens close up sooner in an embrace, not in a, not in a, a punitive way or an, um, uh, an absolute panic kind of paranoiac way? Yeah, I, I love that. And uh, what you said earlier, Petty, around the, the words we use, uh, for me, I, I, I resonate with that. And, and in a way, is it, are we at war with this? Or is it a friendly kick in the butt to say, wake up humanity? What, what, what Heidi was saying earlier in the introductions, is this a friendly virus that kills to wake up? What, what exactly is it? Is it a, in, in, the, in the bigger scheme of things, time for us to, to see the opportunity in the midst of that? While it's a crisis, it's, it's, many people are, are, are dead and are dying. In the context of that, in, in the work that we're doing with, other, with people, human development, and that, what is it that we can look at here and see differently in that? And how will that support us as humanity and other beings? I like that you look at other beings, not just human beings, other beings that may not be directly affected by this, but indirectly. How do we all life on, on, plan, on the planet, on Earth, how do we get to see things a little differently after this? Do we have the, the, do, do we have the breadth and the scope to look at things that far and that much and that breadth and that broadness of perspective? Or we are limited by our frames that we currently use to, to look at ourselves? I think that it's inevitable that we get confronted with our expectations, with our taking things for granted. And maybe uh, there is a chance that people get some gratitude when things start to be better again. I don't know. For me, it is 50 per 50%. If people learn something out of it, or if they feel entitled, finally, they can get back into their old life. And if, the, if they do this, that would be not so good. But if they get more aware of the gift we have being alive and being on the planet and having the resources of the planet, that we might be more mindful in planning our future, being less reliant on markets and things, you know, and uh, being more, coming more together in smaller, communities and revaluing the land. You know? I'm, I'm beginning now again to do a vegetable garden, which I didn't do anymore because I thought it's easier to buy the stuff, you know, and that's, uh, but maybe when we come together then in communities and not only a crazy German woman in Italy does, uh, does that, you know, when more people come back to take care for the earth or for the country, in the country, maybe that would be a chance for a more humane way of being together in smaller groups and not in anonym anonymity as it happens in these big cities. So Heidi, is, is that word care something that we really need to work with? You know, how, how do we actually build the capacity for care? Um, and that comes with awareness, that comes with actually bringing the lens in as, as teachers or as coaches or as 
people holding forums such as you are and all the communities that we, we um, can influence and touch and um, the work we do in organizations, the work we do with students. There's our, our opportunity in our families. Um, we have a WhatsApp group going in an extended family, which we haven't had before. And um, because there's so many media platforms to kind of negotiate. So that's going to add another challenge to people in how do we sift out what is valuable to us and what is meaningful and um, stay in connection and um, find different ways to do that and safe ways. And it's going back to some of the, the earlier health um, habits that were formed in early primitive cultures to say, when I say primitive, early cultures, to say this is actually good sense in how we manage the earth, how we manage um, hygiene, how we manage interaction with each other. So that thing of including and transcend, I think, you know, as, as we often talk of in our community, that we let go all these things that should have been included in. So what are we really going to let go of? I mean, and I know we're asking a lot of questions. I think we can name a lot of things that can be let go of. My question is, how do we actually help people to take that action and not fall asleep again once we go back to the norm? Um, how do we, we enable, for me, the biggest work at the moment is to help people manage the anxiety and manage the tension and to see, to bring the other lenses into their capacity to see. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I also found I, I want to, I also want to retreat. I think this is a beautiful opportunity to retreat. So let me just be with my own thoughts and be with my own self and my own garden and do my vegetable thing. However, there's a beautiful concept, which I also use in the teaching. Um, Winnicott um, was one of the psychoanalysts and a pediatrician who talked about the holding capacity. And it's in many of the spiritual traditions of how we form the sacred spaces, how we hold the inner and outer spaces, one of activity and one of sacredness, one of containment, one of freedom and where chaos actually has a benefit to creating energy so we're at the intersection of um i was listening to to someone speak this morning on a, a podcast i think it was artie Wu, um who holds some uh, program some um Oh, what? my words are escaping me. He was on, on a platform and he was talking about the, um, the, the profane and the, um, the sacred and how the marketplace is outside the doors of the temple and how you go in, you can do all your market activities to negotiate the price of a goat um, in order to take it into the temple to have it as a sacrifice. But once you enter the temple, you don't use the same strategies that you use in the marketplace to enter the temple because there you give over you actually let go and you surrender into something else you're not bartering you're not trading you're not negotiating you're surrendering some part of yourself into a, a space of containment and sacredness which can allow you to think and allow you to connect with spirit and this boundary, this threshold that we negotiate on a day-to-day -day basis, I think gets extended and has been extended onto privileging the marketplace rather than privileging the sacred and the contained spaces where we were able to have creativity and um, connect in other ways. And this is, this is how, how do we build these skills and the skills of mindfulness, the skills of actually talking through it, the skills of looking through different lenses. These are all things we have available and how do we, we need to share them. We need to get onto those platforms in very mindful ways to actually share them and embrace and, and help others to see that there are ways to continue life and to expand life and to be more um, 
respectful of life. The one, one question there for me is on the, our capacity to stretch. And, and there's, a, there's a part about willingness and the capacity to actually do it. And, and then there's an additional part about the, the envisioning of the, the ideal or desired future that we see as a collective. I think there is a shift that's, that's looming here, that's emerging. Uh, Petty and Heidi on this, that as beings on this planet, we look at things in a particular way, and we, we have some areas of comfort that we think this works for us. This has served us well. These, uh, their principles, their philosophies, their, you know, the world, global commerce, commerce, politics in that. There are things here that are calling us to, to transcend that. So the question in that is, what is our, let's call it feasible, doable stretch? What is it, how far can we stretch? And from, from are we clear where we are and stretching towards what, to become what, in the service of what? And we can't be thinking individual now. We think the irony of it, what, what Petty was referring to earlier, we're in isolation, self-isolation, as a, as a strategy to, to survive. And yet the survival requires that we connect and communicate beyond the bounds that we, we, live, with, we live in every day. So how, what is that stretch? How do we stretch from what to what? And maybe we can have a chat about that. Mm, I think that's a great question. I'm yeah. not, for us personally to, to say, you know, what is our stretch? I'm not so sure it's under the hour. I, I would like to take personal responsibility at this moment with the awareness of the, the hour and the we. But what, what will I do when I leave this conversation? Or what am I doing now? What are we actually doing now in the we to build this capacity and stretch? And, yeah. and I want to think about what is my real personal stretch now? in this moment because I too fall into the, the, the seduction of talking about what we have to do. Yeah. 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 And I love I, that. Yeah. I feel it's very the strongly the, uh, the push into, you know, only some days ago I thought, Oh, I thought now I'm old enough and I don't have to develop anymore, you know, but <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> and it is very, um, let's say, uncomfortable to go out of the of the comfort zone. But on the other side, I find that it's enlivening me. You know, before life seemed to be going a certain binary and always the same, more or less. You know, there are some variations, but not really a something to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the conferences. These things, yes, you know, but. There seemed to be some monotonous uh, way of doing, of being, but this is for the price of not being too much upset and everything, you know. Uh, and now it's called, okay, now you have to do something. I don't know yet exactly what. I won't go into the hospitals and take care for the people because I'm in the risk uh, group. So I, I leave that to other people. But what can I do? Uh, I mean, this is maybe a little part of it, but it's not, not yeah. exhaustive, you know. I, I'm still trying to figure out with uh, German people how they can integrate people, how they can bring other, their colleagues to go online and things like that. So something yeah. is emerging and this is also really exciting, despite the way that you don't know if you still live in a month or, you know, or in, in, in 15 days. So also coming yeah. to terms with this death the own death, you know, I have seen other deaths, but their own death, you know, it's still a, a different thing. So we have now the opportunity to really go into the depth of everything and figure out who we are. Because yeah. mm, <laughs> who yeah, knows? To, to, answer, to answer that question, uh, I'm very interested to share what one thing that uh, I saw one video clip of Marianne Williamson. Uh, that we, we most of us know know her and her book on the on on looking at things differently, and she shared something about what 
other people are doing around the world. That's Marian Williamson. And she said, just reach out to at least three people in your circle that you know may, actually, may possibly leave alone or uh, elderly people or any other people like that that you feel may need that social engagement. For me, that's one thing that's easy and that I've already been doing that. For other people, that's normal. We do that anyway. And, 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 and as you, Petty, you would know that across, our, across the continent as Africans in this part of the world, it's what we live with and it's part of what Ubuntu is. You connect, you engage, you, you, you reach out to others, even so-called strangers or others, there's no other. You reach out, you engage, you connect. In that. But now we're being called to make that uh, a part of who we are without the physical contact, but reaching out using the technology that's here. This is artificial intelligence, social media platforms, using them to do what we have always been aware must be done, but maybe we have not chosen to do. So reaching out to at least one, two, three, for people a day that you haven't reached out to, that you haven't, because you won't be able to see them for weeks or months. Now, reaching out using these platforms is the one thing that we can do. Like right now, the three people in different parts. I'm in Johannesburg, Pet is in Cape Town. You are in Italy, Heidi. And we are talking as if we're in the same room. And this, this recording will reach around the world. So use these platforms to connect, engage, and share. And this is what we are called up to do now, to, mm -hmm. to connect anew, afresh, in ways that we haven't done before. The intent behind that is what we need to work on. If I can um, bring in my sensory now, kind of, I wanted to, you know, lean forward and touch the screen and um, touch you. And I think what is beautiful, yes, is our imagination. We actually don't have to be in a space to actually create the sensation and the memory, reactivate the memory of touch, because it is an incredibly important thing. So um, it brings in all the oxytocin. So if we're not doing the touch, then what happens to all the oxytocin? Um, will that be changed into something else so i think we have to call on the imagination i mean there will be groups and families we we will be able to take care and make sure that we we can touch with um not spitting on each other or <laughs> making sure we've got lots of soap but that's in communities who have lots of soap my heart go out to the communities who don't have these things available who are not even going to have access to um, this kind of um, platform. And for us, in part of that container mind, there's something about a maternal preoccupation that is a universal preoccupation. Can we hold in mind those that we cannot touch? Can we hold in our collective mind with love and with an honoring? You know how we feel when we know we're in somebody else's mind. We are, um, we can feel that love we can feel that connection we can reimagine it and there's something about that in neuropsychology but there is something about that in the psychoanalytical space and in the spiritual space of how do we know god is around us how do we know that we are held how do we know that how do we really know that if we've had early um, experience of being loved and connected with then we can reclaim those memories and the imagination of that. For those who haven't, I'm worried about them. I'm worried about the part of me that feels disconnected. I'm worried about the part of me that feels, oh my gosh, um, have I got enough food in my kitchen? Should I go out? No, I don't want to go out. If I go out, should I put um, gloves on? And do I look at people? What was so interesting in a walk the other day, which I went to a very excluded space just to get some ex exercise, people weren't even looking at each other because I think they think if we look at each other, we have to engage. And then if you have to engage, you have to come closer. So let's hold the gaze away. 
and the most beautiful thing of a mother and child is that that maternal gaze so and and sabona is one of our you know beautiful greetings is that i see you i really see you so I think for me, if I can bring more into my immediate world, that sense of, I see you, I, I don't, I can imagine a hug. I can feel it, I can glow in it. And can we put time aside for meditation where we are actually sending our energy and our minds into the communities who do not have access to tangible platforms can we trust that there is some other way in yeah. which to do this yeah i, I love that the I sensory, yeah the sensory part that you referred to petty I, I love that because there's what what this is calling us to do or inviting us to do is to sense into each other and to to access those parts of our human intelligence that we have for so long suppressed or regarded as less than or as not not so valuable because we are so cognitive we live in the in the in our head and you must be logical you must be you must think use your head and and that. and what this is saying is that we need to appeal to and access the heart just to drop a little bit from the mind, the head space, to the heart, and then to the being and to the gut. What you're saying that when you when you reached out to touch the screen, I thought, oh, okay, now she's in isolation. Should I reach out and and get my? <laughs> my... No, I don't have to. She, we we sensed on each other like that. I don't have to be cleaning my hands or go wash my hands. Yes, I I have to wash my hands every now and then and I do it religiously, my kids do it. But we need to reach out to that part of ourselves of sensing into each other, connecting at a deep, profound level in who we are and knowing, inner knowing that we are connected and then reach out to that part and, and bring more, heighten more that awareness of other intelligences that make us connect, interconnected humans or interconnected beings, that when I see someone, when, when I see uh, the military vehicles in Italy picking up bodies, what happens to me? What do I feel when I see that? When I see videos of hospitals in Italy or in China or in, 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 in Iran, the hardest hit places in the world, what happens to me? How do I feel about that? Do I dismiss it? Or does it, do I feel like I am impacted or affected by that? And, and that awareness, Pedro, you're talking to the sensory part, the neuroscience side of things, for me, will become more important now. I'm also, you know, fascinated at a, a, a broader level of looking at how, how leaders are handling it. And those who have tried to get away with a lack of substance and um, a bullying, egoic, uh, I won't mention names in both our country and in um, many other countries, where the self-centered, um, impulse-driven, I can only see anything that really impacts me. If I'm not the center of it, then I... It doesn't exist actually. So everything is constructed around a reality that reinforces my personal existence. They are really being able, they really are having this as a, a wake up call because the, the facades are dropping. The, um, the memes are, are been exposed in, in very different ways. And I, I look at our own president who's stepping up. Um, I think um, just negotiating all the religious groups that we have here, um, Demi, uh, you know, his negotiation skills are, are, are renowned and um, his sense of humor is renowned as well. 
So there's something about the qualities of what it is to cope with these stages as well. What are the qualities of the leaders that we're looking in, looking at to or hoping for to emerge as, as they, this time comes in? What are the, how do we as coaches and supporters of leadership development work, how do we support our leaders in going, how do you center, how do you gain clarity how do you manage from conventional into the more post-conventional capacities to see wider ranges of what is possible to come up with alternatives you know to it and recognizing each person or each group at their at their constriction point at their fixation points because in those fixation points they will continue doing what they will have always continued because that's the safety valve so leadership at the moment is having to answer multiple um, conditions of being able to create safety for multiple um, groupings of people um, and individuals to shift the economic structures. Our banks, like many other banks, are putting in moratoriums. You know, I've asked leaders in fast changing um, organizations to say, just the, the, the organization, the people are under so much stress. Can you just call a moratorium? Can we just be still for a month? Don't go for any achievement, just quieten down. So if organizations can, and governments can take that opportunity to say, I, mean, I know there is on the one side, a huge speeding up to respond to emergency plans. At another level, can they hold this tension of going, some things are slowing down, how do we utilize that time or that energy that we have there to be able to hold this tension? Now that is going to require um, support from many of us who have some skills in helping that, have honed some techniques um, in managing that and just to have the conversation, just to have the conversation um, I love David White's um, poetry around the relationship is the conversation. The conversation is the relationship. So these are the conversations in our mind. These are the conversations with each other. These are the conversations leaders are having with their um, uh, teams. Um, and, and we can support that as well. We've got those skills that we've trained. How many years do me? How many... Yeah. Uh, Heidi, how many years have we been working with honing our skills for this moment? Um, and I think this, the time is there. Yeah, and the leaders, the part about leaders and leadership globally, is leaders can't hide now. I'm, I'm conscious of touching my face or touching my glasses. There's a new habits that we, we need to start looking at. Change is difficult. It's a simple thing, like don't touch your face. It's a, People do that and realize I don't have to. Now, leaders have patterns, have ways that have worked for them before. And they, they, it's easy during crisis to fall back into what is familiar. So very important for us to, to know that in the context of, of this challenge, global shift, we need to see leaders, see leaders as under the spotlight everywhere and for me uh, seeing the leaders in our part of the world petty in in south africa the our, our president stepping up and then some religious leaders saying no we'll go ahead and have our church services where they have many people in there and in the context of this and and then the social media uproar at that and people changing saying whoa okay i'll, I'll change so there's a collective uh, awareness and push and pressure on leaders to show up differently mm. and leaders that don't show up get exposed and get challenged and change their perspective or their narrative very quickly so or they say, they move yeah, out or, or move out or yeah they change or move out or they some of them dig their heels in but at massive cost for them for that so the leadership part is a is another huge area to look at in terms of our work as coaches or people working interested in, in interrelationships. How do we support leaders 
by, because we are leaders in our own right where we are now, we're being called on to lead ourselves, to, to self-isolate that very term alone, say something. You need to, you're leading yourself to stay in isolation like you are right now, Petty. Like I was last week when I came back from, from Seattle. I had to self-isolate, I had to self-quarantine, waiting for the results. And after testing negative, still had to stay put in one place and isolate myself from everybody. It's, it's, it calls upon us to self-lead. That self-leadership, each and every one of us is being called upon to lead where we are and then hold each other to account by holding each other to, to that standard, say, do not gather and, and converge in, in large groups like that. Limit, flatten the curve by yeah. holding each other to account. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. The self-leadership comes really first to be able to be of, um, of help for others. And I really do hope all the years, the decades of self-development that we did, that it will be enough to at least do something. And I, I think somebody says, courage is not the absence of fear, but doing the things anyway, even if you are fear. Or in this case, even if we are not perfect in self-leadership, even if we also fall into fear or into preoccupation and something. But we by techniques, as you said also before, Paddy, we have somehow learned to get ourselves out of the, of the mud again. And, and so when we are able to do this, then we can be a force for others to, to help them to, to learn techniques. For instance, uh, I'm here a, a couple is living over winter with me. They wanted to go home to Germany, but now they stay here because it's safer. And she was very in anxiety. Then I said, do you do breath exercises? No. And, uh, you know, and so slowly, although they were always like this, but now I can slowly introduce some of the things I know uh, which help, you know. But it took almost a year that they take something. <laughs> what I think is a, a good way to meet these things. But so it will be with many, many people. And we need to find the moment also, the right moment, to be able to tell them what they could do without coming over like, oh, the, the, no, everybody, they want to put their stuff on, on them, you know? Mm. How do you say this? They're all omni-knowing omni person, so that we begin to be mm. seen like, you know, this. Mm. So that's, it's very delicate, and it's... Huge yes. learning, in my opinion. We, really, we, yeah. we are learning a lot. <laughs> yeah. in how to... Maybe before we, before we come towards the end, uh, Heidi, I know you're hosting us on this. We have eight minutes. And we, we had indicated that we might show the numbers on this day, on the 23rd of March, 2020, as we have this conversation. What are the current numbers that we have? Sure. Gosh. I mean, those red parts are just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Heidi, you're muted. Unmute. Unmute. I'm sorry, I, I was talking away. <laughs> Yeah. I was saying that uh, U.S. is still on the is now in the third position, and they took a long time to understand that there is something needed to be done. In Italy, it's we have a, a lot of death, only six hundred yesterday in one day, and we are still growing in infections. We are on the fifty nine thousand infections, which mm -hmm. are the stated infections. There are many, many more for sure, but we don't even have enough uh, tests for everybody if they wanted to do that so um, but we have also more or less the same deaths as the uh, healed people in the whole world healed are 98,000 or almost 100,000 that's good but also 14,759 deaths and we don't know how many deaths were before you know before they started to count really uh, I mean yeah, and as I heard, as I, I looked it up, the Spanish flu, no? 
uh, in 20, uh, 100 years ago, they had between 15 million and 100 million deaths. Wow. They don't even know how many. And there are still people who say, oh, that's all exaggerated. If we don't isolate spatially, not socially, that is a good distinction, I think, then we could arrive at these numbers. And who wants that? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is something about the, is Mother Earth kind of cleaning us up? Um, and the, the awareness also has to come in terms of, I mean, if you can see these maps, you know, how are we going to be monitored in the future? What other viruses? And I'm not only talking about biological viruses. What are the other viruses that will infect our humanity? And um, I agree with you, Heidi. I, I don't, you know, I think it's, I think unconsciousness is, is there, self-interest is there, it won't go away tomorrow, even though we're having to face our death. Um, so, you know, there's still a denial of death right up to the moment of dying. There's, there's still a denial that, that actually it will happen to all of us. And, you know, there's a fatalistic way of, well, you know, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. It doesn't matter if I have it this way or that way. It's... Um, yeah, these are interesting they're moral questions that are going to arise from here. And I think one of the things that really do help us is having some of the maps that we do have, you know, an integral map and a map of um, managing um, and navigating this complexity. Because if we just take those four essential quadrants, if we're looking at what do we have to do, we have to work with ourselves. We have to work with our relationships and the shared vision and, and get by into certain things and not go into the shadow of it, not go into the downside and the shadow of manipulation and yeah. um, self-interest, um, narrow self-interest, which is not about all of us because how do we not see um, the workers behind the, all the systems that we benefit from. How do we, we think they're non-existent? How do we think our health practitioners and the people growing our crops and all of those are irrelevant and are not vital aspects and the crops themselves and the soil itself? How do we not see that this is relevant? Mm -hmm. But if we're looking at just those four quadrants, we, we have to do the self work we have to do the work with others we have to look after the body and the the behavior and the genetics we have to look after the environment and the systems and the processes we need to look after all four of them so these maps give us a conscious way to support the developmental model it gives us a conscious way to support the lines of intelligence the um, ways of working with heightening consciousness and awareness. All of these, there are many maps, there are many practitioners who have these maps, not all of them, but they have some of them. So I'm, my request for people is to reach out, to not be so stubborn, not be so self-sufficient, reach out to um, the support that is out there. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. And, and, and to, towards wrapping up again, on, on my side, I would say, the the call is let's let's see each other as one part of a whole and live up to that and be more than we have been before this mm. and let's see each other saubona what Pedi was referring to the isizulu greeting which is i see you Let's see each other across the continents, across the the boundaries that we 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 put around around ourselves and each other. Let's break those down and see each other and support each other through this and beyond this and after this, and include and transcend and be more than we have been. This is a wonderful closing word, I would say. <laughs> Patty, if you want to uh, say something still, I, I want to add to that. People can also reach out to us. You know, I'm here and I, I answer to emails or on Facebook mm. or whatever it is. And, mm. you know, my main concern is that people who are locked into their apartments now for undetermined time, because we don't know how long, that they don't get crazy, that they yeah. feel that there is somebody who is caring and who is helping them to manage uh, these difficult times. So 
I'm offering that and they're also in the German integral community we are creating uh, things like that so yeah I would offer that as well from um, you know info at the coaching center with the integral Africa backing but we with the the contact is info at the coachingcenter.co.za to, to contact and we have a whole team including Demi and I who are um, there with we've we've got coaches who are medical practitioners who are leaders who are in government who are um, you know across a range of support meditation mindfulness um, psychology yeah. other help yeah to be there and I think there's something also that you said around um, let's let's create a distinction between false borders and healthy boundaries mm -hmm. and um, that the borders these false borders need to be broken down with healthy boundaried um, behaviors expressions of self and um, consciousness so Thank you, Heidi, and thank you, Jimmy, for an enlightening and wonderful conversation. Very, Absolutely. very grateful. Thank you thank to you. both of us. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Heidi. Wonderful sharing. And to the listeners, let's stay connected. Stay connected and take care. Yes. Take care. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>